Dear Grandad, I never met you, and the family from the time when I was a child never talked about you. Except once, Dad mentioned in passing that you had died in China in the 1940s, and for some reason, had a monument built to you. I thought it was strange that you, having been born in Hong Kong, but then taken as a baby to Malaya where you grew up, lived and worked, would have died back in our ancestral village in China. Your father had left the village at the turn of the 20th century, along with a wave of migrant Chinese laborers headed for Southeast Asia, America, Australia and Africa. And why did the family never talk about you in the 60 years since your death? Why does grandma's gravestone not bear your name? 10 years ago, when I was going to be posted to China as a foreign correspondent for a newspaper, I pestered dad and his older brother about you. They were reluctant to talk. One Chinese New Year on my visit home, my mom handed me a black and white photograph. The man in the photograph stood confidently, hands on hip. He was not tall, had a high forehead and thick lips. And a camera was slung around his neck. Another photographer in the family? I was intrigued. Eventually, Oda's uncle coughed up a letter from his drawers. It was one of many letters relatives in our ancestral village had written to us over the 60 years but we never replied to them. The family wanted to forget you, forget China, and forget that chapter of history. I called the only phone number on the letter and introduced myself as your granddaughter. They thought I was lying and tested me by asking me to name your five children. On New Year's Day in 2011, I got on a bus in Hong Kong and rode seven hours north to Meizhou City in Southern China. I looked around the old town Are these the same roads you walked? The same things you saw? I took a van back to our village, going past the jetty that great-granddad had left China from in the late 1800s. And the same steps you must have walked back up when you returned to China in the 1940s. I met our relatives. I found the house that great-granddad had built and where you had lived when you returned. I looked for traces of you and observed the rituals in this 100-year-old house where our relatives farm, live, gamble, and sometimes eat rat for breakfast. I asked them how it was that you came back here in early 1949, in the final months of the civil war between the communists and the nationalists in China. I heard how you were chased down, surrounded, arrested, and then jailed by the nationalists because you had joined a communist guerrilla army unit in our home village. I learned how you were eventually executed in July 1949 by the nationalists, just two months before the communists declared victory over China. Your side won the war, but all that remains of you is a monument to our village, in our village to your martyrdom. And this photograph. The only thing relatives said you had brought back with you from British Malaya. It was your prison photograph. It bears your detainee number. Your eyes seem to have lost the luster they once had. Painful as it was, Oda's uncle began to open up. We found old family photo albums. In one picture, it looks like you were in your high school volleyball team. You were squatting in the front row, first from left, posing as if you were trying to keep the hairy mole on your left arm in the shadows. 
I now know that mole was how your body was identified from amongst the corpses in the mass grave you were left in after execution. I now know that in the 1930s, you had been a school principal and then a leftist journalist and photographer in Northern Malaya. You were a community leader. By all accounts, you were an advocate for social justice. Like most overseas Chinese who still cared for China, you and grandma did theater in the streets to raise money for the anti-Japanese war in China. You were arrested and waterboarded for, by the Japanese for this. They hung you from a tree. You survived and continued being active in politics, culture, and in intellectual circles. When the British returned after the war, you were part of a wave of anti-colonial sentiment. You made anti-British speeches. You became the chief editor of a leftist newspaper in Northern Malaya and published anti-British editorials. As the winds of the Cold War were blowing everywhere around the world, you were arrested by the British who had declared emergency rule in Malaya as the communist-led resistance grew. The guerrillas in the dense jungles across Malaya sabotaged British rule and the tin and rubber supply that the British relied on from its prized colony. The British solution to this was to round up 31,000 leftists like you and deport you all to China, whether you had been born there or not. That's how you ended up in China. It was an all-out war in every way but name. The British called it the Malayan Emergency. It was a war that lasted 12 years and left families broken and traumatized. History is written by the victors and this trauma became buried with time. And the bodies of my uncle and other families like ours. I wanted to understand this trauma, this amnesia. I wanted to understand you, the political choices you made, the fire you had in your belly. I traveled around Southern China, Hong Kong, Malaysia, Thailand, and Singapore to do our history interviews with other Malayan leftists whose lives parallel yours. They fought against the British and got deported or exiled. I met men and women now well into their 90s who were the foot soldiers of what they saw as a just national liberation revolution. Like with so many other places in the third world at the time. I asked them why they wanted the British out. I asked them what it was like to be on those ships being deported to China. I met many who were lucky, unlike you, and lived on to find good jobs in communist China. I met others who stayed on in Malaya and went into the jungles to fight to establish a communist state for the next 30 years, living in the rainforest between Malaysia and Thailand. They had their own field hospitals, radio station, printing press, and made their own weapons. They went on fighting for the idea and ideal of communism. Laying down arms only in 1989. Some remain exiled today in the jungles of southern Thailand. They gave their lives to a failed revolution. And most are now fading from the scene. I drove around northern Malaysia and southern Thailand, in the towns where you had lived, worked, and also in the so-called black areas where the communists were active, where they had ambushed British soldiers, shot British rubber estate managers, 
where they hid in limestone caves, lived with tigers and elephants in the jungles. I visited the old tin mines founded by the British and that jail where they had kept you. I went to the cemeteries of Commonwealth soldiers who were killed by the so-called bandits and communist terrorists. One of their graves reads, one day we'll understand. In our family, this Barrett chapter of the Cold War left grandma and great-grandma to raise your five children without you. I feel I can understand the choices you made in those turbulent times of big politics. The family now thinks the genes skipped a generation and your sense of social purpose passed on to me. But grandma must have been very angry when she said, you chose politics over family. And she must have been thoroughly heartbroken to lose you. She never remarried. One day, we might understand. Just to contextualize the conversation that we're going to have, I would like to share about two projects um, and just give you a little bit more information, background of where it's derived from, and perhaps some of the themes that we can discuss uh, later on in the conversation. So here, as you can see, is the front poster of a little uh, exhibition that I did last year. It's called Unauthorized Medium. It was curated for an organization called Frame of Frame in Amsterdam. And it ran from the 15th of September to the sort of late November last year. So the way this exhibition came about was that I was first invited to curate a show about Southeast Asia, which is the way it was phrased, or with artists from Southeast Asia. And I was quite loath um, to think about curating a survey show. Uh, it's not really my thing. And also, I think it was sort of beyond the feasibility of budget and size of the space to really do such a project justice. So I was trying to find another way through that sort of question, like how do we work with artists who are working in relation to Southeast Asia without directly saying, here's you know, the canon of artists of Southeast Asia that you should know about now. And so I was doing a lot of research and I think it struck me at that point of time that you know, it was really interesting that artists were addressing in very varied ways um, and very different methodologies, uh, a kind of idea of archive and responding to an issue of archive, but in ways that you might not even frame as being about archives to begin with. So I'm just cycle through some images so you can see that. So here are the participating artists. I'll let you read that on your own. And we also had a public program uh, in September and November at the beginning and end to sort of bookend it. So when thinking about archives and the works that these artists were doing, then they were approaching it in very different ways. If some artists were approaching the archive as a resource. So they were working in very processual um, methods where they would look at research and building research through the project that were presented. Some artists were thinking about archives in a much more broader philosophical term, such as, you know, it's the, the, I guess, the digital realm, what might happen with obsolescence, what would happen if the world became a pile of hard drives, um, and the digital mind was, in a way, a representative of a broader cosmology. And other artists were also looking at the world around us as perhaps other types of archives, such as perhaps the land, um, perhaps the resources that are running out, perhaps the skin, uh, you know, if we're thinking about embodied histories, um, perhaps looking at the skin of um, a person might give us an indication that there is a different type of archive at work here. And through this, I think what was really interesting was also how artists were highlighting the glitches in the archive. So archives having negative space, absences in the archive, uh, misfilings in the archive, things that were kind of misnamed or bits of information that were incomplete. And this became a way to generate artwork and artistic questions. So here's a show. Uh, forgive me, the resolution is a bit low on this. I hadn't quite realized your screen was really massive. So, um, so I'm just going to cycle it and see it's a group show. And so we have you know, installation, video, um, photography, 
Again, mixed media installation here. I'm just going to let it pause there. And I think as a group project, what some of the questions that were derived from it is, are um, what materials are allowed to be recognized as archival records? What groupings are there allowed to be validated and recognized as an archive? And so artists would address these different issues through the way they approach the archive. So social and political issues linked to memory, such as wars and genocide, and legacies of trauma and tradition. They would think about the notion of organic archives, such as in embodied histories or in endangered nature. And they also thought about the everyday, the everyday and the mundane that formed an alternative cosmology or lexicon. And also, then artists were also thinking about digital replications and the way images were circulated as motifs and almost took on a life of their own. And these archives continue to proliferate. So rather than think about archives as a sort of, you know, national records, um, you, know, you know, those dusty old places where you, you need white gloves to enter and they never change and you're not, not allowed to do anything with them. Artists were sort of expanding the idea of the archive as something that was always amorphous and changing and collecting dust along the way um, as they worked on it. So this then opened up an understanding in a way that there are borders also within an archive or within archives, between archives and the way we approach them. Because always then history becomes a construct that's being done in the present towards a past that's already gone, a past that might be impossible to really grasp. So history is always an ongoing act of constructing. And then that becomes important to ask then, who gets to hold knowledge who gets to hold and control archives and gatekeep who else gets to access archives? And therefore, who gets to make those narratives? Who gets to tell the stories? So just here is just one interesting example, which is a series of, um, I guess, documentary photographs made by a Cambodian-based artist called Vandi Ratana. And here, as you can see um, in these three images, they look very kind of rural and idyllic. You know, you can imagine sort of soft winds blowing. But actually each of those features and the water features in the images are due to craters that have been caused by um, ordnance that have been sort of bombed um, during the war. And so they've been sort of filled over with time. You know, plants have grown in, water filled it in. So they almost kind of disperse into the land looking like natural features. And interestingly, Ratanaling tells the story of how in Cambodia a lot of things are hidden beneath the surface and how because of the killing fields, you know, we imagine that we've already kind of uncovered the truth and, you know, that there's now a truth commission uh, with regards to the genocide. However, every time, you know, there's heavy rain and the earth shifts again, they find more bones, they find more evidence of other spots that are not quite spoken about yet. And it's particularly moving because just next door to it, you can't see it in this image, um, yeah, here you go, um, is a work that he's made. Uh, is we showed two videos out of a trilogy and where he actually makes this monologue confronting a very, very large mango tree. And again, it's presented as being sort of very idyllic and calm and meditative until you are drawn into a very harrowing narrative where he lets us know that underneath this tree is buried his sister and grandmother, uh, who were also killed during the Khmer Rouge, and they were buried along, you know, many others in a mass grave. And now, of course, the grave is covered over by this very lush tree, so almost disguised by a kind of recycle of birth and life. Um, but again, you know, th there are these sort of deeper hidden histories. So that's just one uh, example from that project. I'm just going to show you a few more pictures from the show. And here I'll just highlight that this is the other project where this wine is made out of a bark uh, which infuses um, a special kind of winemaking process where the rice wine then um, is taken on this flavor. But what's happening here is that the resources where this water that is being used to make the wine, as well as the forest, are being uh, polluted and eradicated respectfully. 
um, res respectively, due to um, mining, the mining industry that's kind of encroached upon this region in the mountain. So the artist here, Tuan Mami, spent three years um, living among the villagers, uh, being embedded, experiencing for them what was a great disruption in the community and the loss of their local resources because this community is very famous for their botanical knowledge, their herbology, and also making this wine from very local resources. So here, the audience then becomes, uh, is invited to partake of some of this wine, which is very strong, I tell you. It's, it's not wine the way we define it as whiskey, really, um, or sherry. And um, when you take on this, when you drink this wine in a way you taste and then also embody the history that is infused in the bark. As we know, the tree bark holds a lot of history of the site and land. There's a whole kind of study of history through the trees, as, uh, known as dendrology. So in some way here, the artist is flipping away, uh, flipping around the idea of the archive by thinking of how something such as the bark of a tree that holds history can be used to be made into an artistic process that can be shared with the visitor in a very visceral, embodied way. This is just another view of the show. And here um, I would just point out that uh, this is Chien's uh, project that was included in the show. One day uh, we'll understand. And if you note um, the images that you've seen in her slideshow earlier, some of them here are covered with a kind of tracing paper. So it's a different way of presenting the work and it's, we've got some of the email correspondence that she's had uh, with various parties also um, placed on the wall alongside the images. We can talk a little bit more about that during the conversation. So I'm gonna move on to the second project. Uh, this is known as the Southeast Asia Performance Collection. This is both a digital and hard copy archive or new collection of materials about performance from Southeast Asia. It was initiated by Something Human uh, at the time, which was co-directed by Alessandra and myself. And uh, through this process, we managed to gather over approximately 27,000 items in the digital archive in around, I think just under 100 in terms of hard copy items. And all of this is now um, openly accessible to scholars uh, and held at the Live Art Development Agency's library. They call it library, not archive. Um, so here's some images from what's in it. So this archive does not purport to be comprehensive at all. It only covers some of the countries in Southeast Asia, not all of them. Uh, it does have quite a range of different types of performances. Here you can see um, some images from Yurik Lau and Tio Johan from Singapore. Their work is very digitally mediated, um, and Johan specifically also likes to work with choreography and dances. Here is um, an image from a series of works named as Untitled, uh, but it's part of the Rubber Man series um, by Cambodian artist Kavai Samnang. Uh, this is a really interesting piece where he basically infiltrates different parts of a rubber plantation, and it sort of echoes a uh, sort of recurring motif in his work where he centers his body and the labor of his body as a way to emphasize his relationship or his anxiety uh, about what's happening in the environment around him. So some of his work, he's gone to places where they've reclaimed too much land or taken too much sand, and he takes a bucket of sand and then he raises it over his head and pours it over himself. And here he's done the same thing with rubber latex here. And here again, we have uh, a very old image from Journey of a Yellow Man by a very pioneering Singaporean performance artist, Lee Wen, who passed recently. And then on the right, we have an image of Path 8, which is a performance Budi Bajaja did in Venice. Uh, this is an example of a performance piece that we have in video by Hanoi-based artist, Tuan Mami. Here we have a US Khmer Muslim artist, Anita Yo Ali. Uh, she's currently based in the US, but she moves between Cambodia and the US. And here is an image from a kind of long ongoing series that she has called The Buddhist Bug, being of, I guess, the sort of refugee identity, but also being Khmer and Muslim and female. This is where a way of using a kind of post-human hybrid identity and a persona to go back to reconnect with the land of Cambodia. And she cites herself in various locations, 
um, both outdoors and interior, uh, through this guise of the Buddhist bug. Um, and this, is, um, the, this has resulted in an output of a series of photographs and moving image, as well as live performances. So this is just to give you a sense of like the range of materials that we have uh, in the archive. So I think this, the reason why I've mentioned this last project is to really just sort of trigger off some questions around what is involved in the exercise of building an archive. I mean, why did we want to do it in the first place? And it stemmed from the fact that, you know, at that time, Something Human was curating a lot of live art in London. And we were also thinking of tr uh, different ways and methodologies of bridging the live art scenes in Asia and in London. And one of the things that we did was to go to the Lada's, um, go to Lada's library and do a catalog search. And we were surprised that actually there were very few materials from Asia and practically none from Southeast Asia at the time. So this, again, a negative space in the archive made us ask, you know, what do we do to bridge these um, dialogues? And perhaps one of the ways that we can do is to bring some of that material over here. Because in Southeast Asia, while there are a few sort of emerging institutions now, a lot of this material is kept in individual archives, sometimes, you know, under the bed in a shoebox, sometimes in the back room of a small independent gallery, as in Java Arts, which then had a big fire and lost over 100 items. So they're very sort of fragile. They're inaccessible unless you know people and you have to make the journey there to look at the materials. So one impetus was if we were to build this archive, then scholars and artists and curators here have something to respond to. But of course, that raises all sorts of questions, such as how do you collect? You know, where do you start? How do you gather? And how do you think about documentation? And where is the work? If a documentation of a performance that is past, is the documentation then itself now the work if we were to emphasize that in an archive? And following then, there were questions. How do you sort this material when there's 27,000 items? How do you organize that? How do you index that? How do you, you know, again, like for example, one of the questions that seems really simple, like should we, you know, demarcate all the artists into nationalities and countries and make that the organizing principle between how you organize folders. But then even that proved difficult. We were like, well, here's Anita. She lives a lot in the US. She also works a lot in Cambodia. How do we, how do, we do that? In the end, we decided, right, we're just going to go with their names and then we'll create sort of tag clouds around an Excel sheet and eventually, hopefully when all this goes online, um, they will find some way of tagging and categorizing that allows for a kind of more plural approach to categorization. So here, I guess, I'm just trying to put forward, you know, a few thoughts around the potentials and um, pitfalls of what archiving can do. And in a sense, you know, even when you assemble all this material, there's still much more material out there that isn't assembled, perhaps cannot be, because it was sort of before the time of documentation. And so in some sense, even with where we're trying to write and create this sort of very nascent uh, Southeast Asian art history, there will always be gaps, there will always be imperfections and misremembering. So I'd just like to kind of put it all out there so that we can think about that and uh, as Chi and I go into the talk. So this is the second time I've seen you perform this piece. Mm -hmm. In fact, no, this is the third time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And each time you perform it, it's, you know, it's still really gripping and really moving. Um, and the way you sort of paint this very vivid image of your grandfather, um, so much so that sometimes there's a split second that I think, oh, I forget that you've never met him. Mm -hmm. yeah. And of course, there's this wonderful, very intimate um, recollection in the way the style that you've written in the format of a letter. So perhaps maybe we can start by saying, why use the letter format? Mm -hmm. Like, how did how did you come to that decision? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, obviously, my 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 main form, I suppose, as a practitioner is is photography. But I did start out as a writer, and I guess you know this 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 project is very personal to me. And I kind of started having these conversations in my head with this grandfather I never met. And I was trying to find a form to make this very complex story about a very remote war accessible to a general audience who might not know anything about this part of the world or this particular war. Um, it was a you know, far away, obscure thing. And um, 
I decided to kind of translate some of the things I've been saying to him in my head into a text. So that was the first thing. And how it actually happened, honestly, was that I was on an artist residency in Amsterdam. And they, I arrived on the Monday. And they said, your first public presentation is going to be on Thursday at lunchtime. I'm like, oops, OK. <laughs> I have a monster of a project. I've been working on it, I think, by that point for about five years. I have hundreds of photographs. I you know, obviously have video, have sound, have oral histories, have documents. And I was like, how am I going to make this make sense to an audience in 30 minutes? So I just sat down and wrote a letter. I sat down and I wrote a letter to my grandfather. And then I came up with this idea of just reading it live mm -hmm. over the pictures. So the script came first, and then I put the slides together. And the letters actually, um, this is not the first letter I wrote to him. So when I started a residency, I, I have a blog on my website. And I, this project has been with me a long time. And I feel very sorry that I still haven't made anything complete from it. So I wrote him this letter basically apologizing to him that I hadn't gotten off my butt to finish it. And so yeah, so this, is, this, this, this letter that you heard me read just now was sort of one of a few letters that I wrote to him. Um, Can I ask you, because you know, it came about very suddenly with them asking you to make a presentation. Mm -hmm. So obviously you have all this material and these ideas um, churning around in mm -hmm. your brain for a while. And then you sat down and wrote the letter. And the first time you wrote it, like, was it quite emotional, I would imagine? Yeah, it was quite yeah. cathartic, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And it was kind of, um, so the, the bulk of what I read just now was written in that one sitting. Wow, OK. So it was just kind of, yeah, it was quite cathartic. And I was trying to find a form that didn't feel um, not authentic. I still wanted it to feel um, not too contrite. I, you know, it, it, I do have these conversations with him in my head, and I'm not saying anything that I feel is too forced. Mm -hmm. So I feel comfortable with this form. And in fact, now that I'm working on a book, um, I think the text of the book, at least a part of it, will be in the form of this letter as well. And I've been asked several times by other people whether he writes back to me in the book. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, mm, actually, no, I think that's too spooky. <laughs> and I, it feels mm. false because I, in my head, he doesn't speak back to me. Right. Yes, I'm not even sure mm. he speaks English. Right. So but you know, when I go pray to him, mm. I speak to him in Chinese. But, but you don't write to him in but Chinese. But I mean, my English mm. is my main language. So right. it you know, comes out more organically in English for me. Yeah. Right. There was this other letter, which I think you've read also on the blog. Um, and it was this other one where, again, I wrote organically, cathartically, um, you know, just before getting a flight back mm. to um, Singapore, where the story is that his portrait. Hang on, I think, just a second before, because yeah. I know this is a really fascinating yeah. story about how you, you carried the portrait. But I really want to unpack that a little bit more. Like, mm -hmm. when you've written something very personal, like, I can imagine when I write letters, you know, it's a kind of a bit of a lost art now, right? But when we do write something, you know, we write it in our journal, we write a letter, it's incredibly personal. But how did you take that sort of step to say, actually, this is what I want to share? And also... When you share that in public, you know, in your mind, how do you think that's at work? Because I do think that it has a very interesting sort of effect in terms of an audience listening to it as a performance, because it creates an immediate intimacy where you're sort of viewing him through a lens that you're, is through your eyes and your um, very intimate longing, in a way, to know him. Um, it's very powerful. Um, do you feel like, uh, I guess, in your foray as an artist, that it's a, it's a very different experience you're creating from being a documentary photographer, for example? Yeah. yeah. Well, I've never thought of myself as a performance artist, <laughs> first of all. And I'm still a little shy about calling this a performative reading. But I'm, you know, I've become aware that this is in the kind of vein, in artist parlance, is in the vein of a performance lecture. Um, but you know, basically, I kind of realized that the voice and the life delivery of the letter has a lot to do with how it affects people. Mm -hmm. I've done this in different countries and on several occasions, um, even in New York, in, um, in an audience, in an auditorium full of very hardened New Yorkers, um, people cried. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking about my grandfather from, you know, from way back from 70 years ago and from this remote part of the world. They've never heard of this war. 
but there's something about sharing family histories that somehow people connect to. Mm. There's a universal element to it that somehow moves people. And I think, you know, again, it's about making this complex story accessible to, um, to people who don't need to know anything about the specifics of this conflict. Yeah. And I, I have had a habit of letter writing from when I was a teenager. I was a very deep introvert and writing letters, this was pre-emails, I'm not as young as I maybe look, but <laughs> um, so this is pre-email mm -hmm. and I was a deep introvert and the, I couldn't verbalize a lot of my thoughts. So I used to write letters to my teachers, my friends, um, mm. people who were much older than me because I was seeking understanding and I was seeking communication. So the letter writing became a form for me and then email came along and that changed my life mm. because then I could write letters in real time to people. Um, in some sense, I think the letter writing process is interesting and the dynamic of it as well. It's quite Lacanian in some way, right? Because letter writing is, you're, write, you're always writing to a projection of how you view the other person. And we don't know, like, you know, even in the past, you send off a letter and there's always this question mark, are they going to get it? When are they going to reply? Do they read it the same way that I intended? There's always this sort of gap. This mm -hmm. is sort of impossibility of that dynamic ever truly matching. Mm -hmm. So I think that in a way is really interesting in a way that it reflects the sense that you can't actually reach him across, you know, I guess a spatial, time. temporal yeah. chasm of time, yeah. Um, and I just wonder whether, I guess, through that exercise, do you feel that you know him more in a way? In letter writing, yeah, I think there is mm. that, that intimacy of speaking to him, mm. yeah. And how does that shift your practice? Because I think before being a journalist, right, you, were, you spent some time being a journalist, you were trained as a historian. so. I think the discipline of history is quite different. So your approach to, I guess, looking at archives, research material, um, which then of course informs your practice as a photographer, um, how does that shift when you do something like that, which is quite different, much more subjective in some sense? Yeah, I mean, obviously I, you know, I was trained as a, I started off as a photographer, then I trained as a student of history. And then I became a writing journalist for almost 10 years and then became a documentary photographer. So always sort of in the service of seeking truth and seeking supposedly objective facts. And then as I got older and deeper in my work, I started to question it more and more. So I think I'm really at a kind of inflection point or maybe I've crossed it, I don't know. But um, I think there's still a part of me that's the rational social scientific side that is still looking in the archive and looking to find out as close as possible to the truth, the so-called truth, and trying as far as possible to figure out what happened. Mm. But then there's also a growing awareness and realization that I can never reconstruct what actually happened. And I'm actually now perhaps more interested in how people remember what happened. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, it's also a fact that the oral histories that I've collected all these years cannot be verified. And I have to live with the subjectivity in them. And, and I think that actually is, is, is where the interesting um, mm. stuff happens now. It's, and so, you know, on, on the one hand, I am doing a PhD in war studies. <laughs> I mean, in a, in a heavily researched social scientific department. But I'm also using my um, visual art practice to maybe complicate that very evidential approach mm -hmm. and, um, so and to have more license, I suppose, to, to ask questions of my own research. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, I mean, in some sense, I think maybe for the benefit of the audience who may not know, I guess, the full scope of the, how the research started, maybe we could, you could talk a little bit about how you got into the subject and like maybe some of the research paths you've taken, and also because that will, in a way, illuminate this swerve you've gone from looking at existing material, and in some ways, now you're actually creating the materials as well. Yeah, so this whole thing started with, um, as, you know, as in the letter, this, this first photograph that my mother gave me mm -hmm. of this man with a, with a camera, and I was like, who's this dude? Like, he's cool. And um, my mom says, oh, this is your grandfather, your father's father. I'm like, what? You know, and how come we know we never talked about him and, you know, he's a photographer. Oh, my God, you know, there's another photographer. And I mean, 
it started from there, and then I kept asking questions of, of him and his background and all that, and it became a kind of quest to, to find out who this man was, what he did, and then in looking for people who knew him, I realized that there was a bigger story to be told. The bigger story was that the dominant narrative of this war, the Malayan emergency, um, was that it was a very triumphant, effective, anti, um, it was a very effective counterinsurgency um, move, uh, exercise or, um, uh, yeah, it, it's held up as a textbook example of a successful counterinsurgency war. Um, and it's still celebrated like that in Britain and in Singapore and Malaysia because the current independent states of Singapore and Malaysia inherited basically the mantle of the, of the, of the Brits. And um, so on the one hand, you have this very dominant narrative. And on the other hand, you have the fading voices of the left um, who um, haven't had an equal play, I suppose, in, in the mainstream narrative of this, this conflict. So I realized that I had a bigger task, which was to add some of these voices to the, the narrative because they were missing. And so in, in, initially, I was trying to find people who knew my grandfather, who could tell me something about him. And eventually, I ended up meeting people who were of his generation. They were all on the left. They had the same ideology, whether they were card-carrying communists or not. Um, I've never been able to prove that my grandfather was a communist, a Malayan Communist Party member. Um, so I ended up just doing our histories of them, and I, I've ended up sort of collecting their documents, I've made their portraits, I've basically effectively created little archives for mm. each of these people. Um, so so in, in that sense, I've become an archivist, and I'm generating primary material. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's interesting just now you use this term unverifiable archives. So in some sense, you're creating archives out of subjective first-hand material, yeah. such as our histories and so on. But I, I guess I want to kind of dig deeper into that because in some sense, aren't all archives to some extent unverifiable because they're taken from a specific point of view? I, I'm thinking of yeah. how you were saying just now, like you can't find any evidence, written or otherwise, that your grandfather said, yes, I am a communist. But then I think back to you know, various sort of political events in Singapore where a lot of the left, you know, students or union workers got swept up into, a, you know, a kind of communist cleansing uh, thing. And, and then many of them were then asked to sign something to say, yes, you are or you're not. Sure. And even that, I mean, the act of signing doesn't actually, you know, certify that you are because that's just sure. the way that you get out of that, right? Sure. So what we have left are just records of an incident that happened, but we don't necessarily still know. So I'm just wondering how you, yeah, as a historian, Yeah, so I mean, as a historian, as a journalist, yeah. I think that's mm -hmm. in, broadly speaking, there's this principle of triple verification. So if mm -hmm. you can counter check something three ways, then it counts as a fact. Yeah. Um, I think there are certain documents and certain pieces of the archive that can be verified this way. I mean, they mm -hmm. can be counter checked against each other. But what you're also getting at is that there is a, an underlying the act of archiving and the making of archives that is a, that a lot of power structures to, 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 to grapple with also. I mean, mm. who decides what gets archived, what doesn't get archived? And we also know that there are pieces of the archive that have been actively destroyed mm. before being moved back to the colonial metropole. Mm. The stuff was destroyed out there. And this is true of a lot of the colonies, including Malaya including Kenya, including Malaya, and you know, a lot of other colonies. And most of these have to do with the nastier side of the, mm. the colonial actions out there. A lot of them were police records. Um, in the case of the Mau Mau in Kenya, and in the case of Malaya, a lot of it was police records. Um, so I, yeah, for me, it's become interesting to look at not just what's in the official archive, but what's also missing from the official archive. Um, mm. The stuff that I've collected, yes, cannot be triple verified. Um, and initially, I was going to try to cross-verify them with the official archives, but I'm not sure that's going to work at all now. So I think I just have to accept them as subjective accounts. Mm -hmm. They're oral histories, um, and they are personal memories told 60, 70 years on. They are faulty, they are fallible, um, and I'm going to treat them as such. Yeah, and yet without them, we lose a very valuable strand of narrative. Yes, without mm -hmm. them, we have a... We have a basically one-sided 
um, mm. story of this war. I guess maybe this is an interesting point to segue back to the way you presented the project, that particular iteration for unauthorized medium. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, the way you... I remember we had lots of emails and chats about this. Yeah. And um, you had, you know, Jean is a spectacular photographer, so her images are very crisp, unlike my uh, PowerPoint. But so you decided to move from that sort of very central ethos to being a photographer, the crisp, beautiful image, yeah. right? And you made certain choices in terms of the medium, in terms of how you're going to present it. I mean, can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, so in this particular um, experimental installation, little installation, um, mm. what I did was I, I was trying to sort of, um, I guess, question myself and question my own crisp photography. Um, and I started to, I mean, I, it literally became, this picture has gotten murkier and murkier for me as I found more and more stuff and worked more and more on it. So what I did, um, technically speaking, was I printed the pictures on paper that were yellow. So it wasn't like high-grade photographic paper. I deliberately chose not to. So, and we printed them um, with archival ink. So in the sense, the paper were yellow, but the ink will remain. Um, I was just trying to play with that idea of fallibility and, and, and fading. Mm. Um, and with the, with the tracing paper, I was just kind of, I don't know, I was just kind of a little fed up of how clear everything looked, <laughs> I guess. Mm. And, and also, you know, in, in collecting a lot of these people's uh, materials, a lot of their uh, photo albums were in that form of the, you know, the, um, the photograph, Mm -hmm. paste it down and then there's that waxed paper that separates the photograph mm -hmm. from the viewer. So I was just kind of trying to use these ideas to, mm -hmm. to, um, yeah, to realize it in a physical form. Mm -hmm. And alongside that, we had pieces of text, some of which were pulled from the official archives, some of which uh, were transcripts of um, pieces of the oral histories that I had done, which particularly moved me and which relate to the either the object or the portraits that we put on the wall. Um, and then there's one kind of long discussion between me and my oldest uncle, sort of quarreling over the fact, was, or, was my grandfather a communist or was he not? Was he, was he not? Why does it matter anymore? Mm. Maybe, maybe it's not such a bad thing to be a communist in the UK, but it's a really bad word in Singapore and Malaysia. Mm. Like you're condemned if you're a communist. So, so yeah, that's, that's, yeah, so it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's an ongoing debate within the family as to mm. can we call him a communist or not. It's actually politically dangerous to have a communist in yes. your family. And just to give a little bit of context, I guess, uh, in Singapore, uh, we had two, I guess, operation yeah. campaigns, Coastal and Spectrum. And these were things that were kept very quiet about. So when we were growing up, you know, no never one really talked about, about it, never yeah. heard about it. So it was a complete shocker when suddenly, oh, you know, um, we're past the years of, what do you call it, confidentiality and so on. And so papers were released. Because Singapore actually has an ISA Act, uh, Internal Security Act, um, which allows people to be held indefinitely without trial. So I think the first time I heard about that was in the 90s. And I thought, oh my God, I didn't know we had that, you know. And we actually have, at that, at that time, maybe about four or six people held. Um, but subsequently, you know, what's come to pass is that one of the political prisoners was held for 32 years and only recently released. And 32 years is a long time to be held for not wanting to admit that you're a communist while being thought of as a communist. So that's, in a way, how potent the word communist is. So what do you yeah. think it was like when I discovered that, that was a, <laughs> my grandfather was a communist yes. and, and I was badgering my, my dad to talk about it? You know, yeah. he was like, what? Do you think the silence is because of that? Like of course, yeah. yeah. I mean, like I said in the reading, you know, part mm. of it was this, the, the general, over, mm. the overall sort of political climate didn't allow you to admit that you had a communist, you know, not even a leftist in your family. And I think the other half of it was that my grandmother was just heartbroken and she just wanted to forget this man. I think that's what it was. I mean, and, and she ordered the kids never to talk about their father ever again. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and as, as you saw, you know, her grave doesn't bear his name. So it was like she was never married, which I find, I mean, it's like heartbreaking. When mm -hmm. I go and see her, I mean, I, I didn't, I never realized that until I started doing this work. and. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and you know, the fact that she lived with this kind of blank in her life mm -hmm. and she never was able to remarry because her mother-in-law apparently was extremely strict and never allowed her to see other men. And you know, it's, yeah. So it's, it's, it's multiple yeah. layers of 
of trauma and hurt and fear of you know bigger politics all wrapped into mm. all wrapped into it. It certainly underlines, I think, the kind of political risk and how it actually impacts on the personal in the personal life. Yeah, I and it's interesting it when was, people talk yeah. about trauma mm. um, passing down three generations. I mean, I've been asked at the previous talk that we did together whether I feel per personally traumatized by my, mm. what my grandfather did. And I think at the time I said, no, I don't think so. I think I'm pretty well adjusted <laughs> and you know, whatnot. But I think it's inevitable that it remains somehow because the way that my father became very apolitical, very mm. conservative, um, has a lot to do with what happened to his father. Mm. Had a lot to do with the fact that his father died when he was 11 because of his political convictions and um, that his mother banned him from not just talking about his father but from being a participant in any school politics or any, any kind of civil society um, activism was, was taboo, was a no-no in, in the family. So what do you think now? I mean, do you, do you admire your grandfather for his politics? Yeah, so I mean, you know, I just, re I, yeah, I, I, I am in danger of overly romanticizing this guy, mm -hmm. for sure, I recognize that. But I do think that he lived in a different time. Mm. It was the era of the Cold War, and I think you did have to choose a side. Mm. And I think if... I, I often ask myself, if I had lived then, what would I have chosen? I think I probably would have done the same. Mm. I mean, yeah, so that's just how it goes down. But. Also, some other people have asked me sort of, you know, why are you so obsessed with finding out more about him and, you know, all that, despite your family's not wanting to talk about him. I think there's a personal dimension too. I think, you know, growing up in a very conservative family, my dad was a traditional Confucian Chinese father. No emotions, no touch, don't do anything political, um, just study and do well in school. And he even said to my sister, Girls don't need to study so much. Mm -hmm. Just do well in school, get a job, become a school teacher, marry well, buy a house, and have two children. Okay? So that's how he was, or how he is. And I basically checked all the wrong boxes. So for a long time, I felt very misunderstood by my own family. I was kind of a troublemaker, um, young reporter in Singapore at the time, writing about migrant labor, rights abuses. I was you know, active in civil society. I was always you know, active in, in slightly political, socially engaged causes. And um, my own family didn't understand that. They were very disapproving. They often, you know, would say things like, why you, um, you know, don't you have better things to do? Why are you such a troublemaker, you know? <laughs> Singapore's not a place where you do this kind of stuff as a young person. You just, you know, don't. Um, it's probably pretty normal here. Um, but, you know, so when I discovered this man, it felt like, hey, actually somebody else in the family has trodden this path before and did much greater things and took much bigger risks and made decisions that led to his death. So actually, it's okay. Mm. You know? There's something about lineage there, isn't it? It's yeah. I mean, yeah. of course, this is reading backwards and of course, maybe it's a little contrite, you know. And, but I do feel that if only he was still around, I think he would get me. Like he would be okay with me. It wouldn't be such a big deal at all. Um, so, so in some senses, in some sense, um, you know, the fact that I've now done all this work and dug all this up, and I've kind of showed it to my family, of course. Um, I think they also find that this is a this is a way to understand the way I am too. So for them now, the narrative is, oh yeah, his genes passed down to her. But that's also a very Asian thing to say. Right? It is a very yeah. Asian thing to say. <laughs> You're such a troublemaker because your dad was like that. Yeah. Um, so going back to the unverifiable um, archives, I think it's really interesting because you're talking about the image and the crispness of the image and the veracity of a documentary image, um, and then how in your visual arts practice you are playing with issues of visibility and deterioration and fading. And also, I think, interestingly, through the exhibition, when we went in November, so many people were encouraged to look, you know. They were touching the yeah. paper, the tracing paper. So it all became it a bit left their hands. And, yeah. Yeah. It's crumple. the sweat and the Yeah, and also the movement of, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, wind and body bodies passing in that yeah. space. Yeah. So in a sense, you know, it goes back to the whole, I guess, paradox within the photograph image itself when it was first created in the 19th century where 
on one hand, you assume that an image is real because you take an image of something, but then what's purported to be in, in the image can actually be performative or sure. false at the same Yeah. So, I mean, how do you play with that now, now having come through this process, to where you go back to being a photographer, which you still do in your work with Magnum and so on? How do you have that at the back of your mind? Mm, I'm really confused. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I'm a little sort of schizophrenic at the moment. So, um, you know, for some bread and butter stuff, I still do some documentary work and I still do, you know, a little bit of editorial work, um, whether through Magnum or through just, you know, magazines coming directly. But, I mean, less and less of it, really. Mm -hmm. And, no, I think I'm at a, at a phase where I want to sort of interrogate my own self and my own mm -hmm. work. So, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm taking a different approach with different projects. So, obviously, on this one, I'm, um, I'm now intervening with the physical mm -hmm. photographs that I've made. But with other work, um, I think um, there is still somewhat of a more evidential um, documentary approach. So it's a, it's a mix. And maybe you can talk a little bit about how, now that you started a PhD, congratulations, you got a full scholarship at King's. So how do you frame that within your PhD? Because this pro I believe this project is also being extended into your research. Yeah, um, yeah I'm, still trying, I'm still sort of reframing it academically, but I'm looking at the traces of the anti-colonial resistance um, through time and also through landscapes because the landscape in Malaysia where, and Thailand where this conflict um, took place and where these people were exiled um, or deported to eventually um, it's, kind of a, it's kind of an unmarked archive of the conflict so I'm exploring sort of re-photographing some of those places um, and I'm also looking in the official British military archive to try and cite mm. the supposed bandits and terrorists. And I'm looking at how they were represented in those photographs. Mm. And are they present? Are they? They are present. Um, they are a rare sighting. Mm. Um, the things that they left behind were more commonly uh, mm. photographed. So the huts that they, you know, left behind when they escaped the British um, soldiers coming, um, the communist insignia and flags, the, the, the weapons they left behind and things like that were often photographed as almost, um, you know, like trophies mm -hmm. or souvenirs by the official British military photographers. Um, and then on occasion you see photographs of them um, arrested, seat, seated on a police uh, station floor, like the one picture I had in my slideshow. And other times, um, I've seen pictures of them beheaded. Oh, so held up as trophies. Their heads are held up as trophies. By whom? By British soldiers. Okay. Um, so um, they are they're cited, but you know I'm I'm in the process of trying to figure out their how how they how they're represented in that archive and what what gets kept in the archive and what's missing. And I'm yeah so I'm. That's where I'm at. With well, this is so interesting because, in a way, there is a kind of act of, I guess, decolonization. You're going back into the archive, you're interrogating the ver veracity of the archive, you're looking at what's missing, you're trying to piece together other narratives other than the dominant one. But at the same time, you know, I recognize we're all kind of caught in this uh, relationship with institutions which come from a particular legacy of education and what's considered authorized as a narrative, right? So. How do you navigate that? Because on one hand, you know, I, I encountered this in my own scholarship where sometimes I feel like tempted to write a, write a dissertation in a different language just to uh, argue with my professor and she said, no, you can't do that. And um, so how do, you, how do you reconcile these questions? Because in some sense, you're creating your archive as you're working, but in some sense, you're framing it back into you know, a very prominent um, educational institution. Yeah, well, I don't know yet. Mm, okay. Well, I'm. Yeah, I'm. Obviously, I'm a. Yeah, I'm aware that you know certain institutions have their ways of thinking and doing things, but I've not been discouraged from exploring as openly and as critically as I wish. Um, I've had conversations with the Imperial War Museum in London, um, where um, they were interested in doing a show about this particular conflict. I think they feel that the archives on Malaya have not been looked at seriously by anyone before and they were quite thrilled that I was interested. Mm -hmm. I'm just working in the archive and I'm finding what I'm finding. And mm -hmm. 
Um, and then it's to be seen what can be done where and for whom. It, it doesn't really bother me at this point. Yeah. Um, and I think um, we're probably going to find a bigger tolerance for a plural kind of reading of this than maybe back home. Mm. Because in Singapore, immediately this is going to be written off as uh, revisionist history, and revisionism there is used as a bad word. Mm. Um, and um, I'm going to be written into a corner as the granddaughter of someone who died for this ideology, and therefore, of, of course, I will you know, um, be romantic about these now soft and cuddly ex-communists who were once fighters and killers. I mean, I do acknowledge that some of them probably have killed multiple people. I'm, um, I'm, not, um, I'm not an apologist. I'm just trying to sort of capture the spirit and the memory of that time. Um, and to give them their sort of fair say in the narrative. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think what's also interesting is that now that you've opened up your practice um, and being quite experimental with it, you know, you were just about to tell the story of how carrying your grandfather's image led you to do a certain amount of actions. Maybe you can tell a share us a little So, you know, I, like I said, I never thought of, I don't think of myself as a performance artist, but um, the fact is, when I, when I, um, so when I first discovered my grandfather's story and all that, I found this, uh, I guess, um, identity photograph of his, and I had a charcoal artist in our hometown in China, draw a charcoal portrait of him, frame it, and I took it back to our village, to that village home that my great-grandfather built, and we put him in a room there as a sign of respect for this person who came back and, you know, had contributed to the village and all that. And it was very interesting to me that the people in the house, that big house, the house has 32 rooms. So obviously, my family originally had 11 of the 32 rooms, now it's all been taken over by other relatives because we were overseas and we never came back to China. And they were okay with us taking back one room to put his portrait in initially. So every year I would make trips back to the village and I would always go and check in on my grandfather in his room. And over time, over the years, it became clear to me that he was more and more disrespected. So they, ch they moved him to another room and then they put him above a pile of rubbish in the hallway and then eventually they put him in a room with animal feed and you know lots of trash and I just kind of felt wow this guy was a martyr in the village you know school children used to come every year to bow before him the local civil servants used to lay flowers at his tomb and this is how the, the villagers my relatives today treat the memory of this man and I felt really uncomfortable about it and all this time I was in conversation on text message with my oldest uncle who now lives in, who now lives in Singapore and he was just livid. Mm -hmm. He was like, if they can't treat your grandfather with respect, remove the portrait and take him back to Beijing with you. So that's what I did. I went and I said to the relatives, okay, we don't need this room anymore. Here, you can have it back for your fertilizer and animal feed and I'm taking him back with me to Beijing. So I took, I, I took him back to Beijing and then um, and then eventually, I, on one trip back from Beijing to Singapore, I, I wrapped him up in bubble wrap and brought him back without thinking too much about it. And then right before the flight, I was like, hang on a minute, this is me taking Granddad back to Malaya. This is, this is, there's something about it. So I wrote that letter and um, yeah, I, I, took him, I took him back to, I took him back on the flight with me and um, I was in economy class, of course, but the air stewardess was very kind and she's like, oh, you have this big thing, oh, it looks fragile, let me try and find a place where you can put it. So she stuffed him behind business class, <laughs> where he had a, uh, had a spot. So I thought it was kind of funny, he was, uh, so I, you know, he was writing in business class. Um, and then I, I, I had an exhibition in Singapore where um, I, I brought the portrait to, to the reading, to the artist's talk. And, and um, he was sitting there as I read. So maybe that was a performance, I don't know, but. Well, it's interesting because it speaks to me about, I guess, the shift of when uh, an image is a mere object or a documentation, or when the image suddenly takes on a certain liveness, a certain sacrality, you know, depending on the context of who's framing it, who's projecting on it, who's 
you know, in, uh, in a sense, relating to it. It's sort of like, I guess, the, uh, in the exhibition Osenia at, Royal, uh, at the Royal Academy, you had a lot of what, I guess, anthropologists would call um, artifacts. But for many of the people of the Maori communities, these objects were very alive. And so when I was walking past, I was thinking, why, why are there bits of flowers or bits of sand or bits of salt? And, and they said, oh, because we feel that, you know, our gods or our images are feeling very lonely. So here's a little bit of home to keep them company. And your story makes me think of that, about how, you know, something that is an image or actually for yours is a drawing, is a reconstruction. Yeah. But takes on a, a, a different guise. Yeah. You know? I mean, I'm not religious and I'm a pretty rational person. So, you know, I'm, I don't want to, you know, say that there's like sp spooky things about this portrait, but it has taken on that, that mm -hmm. dimension of something to show respect to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this, this portrait now sits in my mother's flat in Singapore because nobody dares to hang it on their wall. Like, mm -hmm. why is that? It's a, you know, so it, it does take on that, that dimension somehow. Mm -hmm. And I guess, I mean, uh, I think it's really interesting because we're going back to the idea that because there are gaps in your archive, the gaps in the memories, the gaps in the communication intergenerationally from your grandmother not wanting to give that information. And so these gaps, these negative spaces have almost like, I guess, instigated you on this journey of trying to reconstruct, reenact, or I guess, yeah, fill in the, fill in the gaps. And how, how have you found that process? Because you were talking about how it's almost a struggle, it's almost an impossibility. Yeah. To fill in the gaps. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it's 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 obviously a race against time because these people are um, very old, or well, most most have passed on. Um, I feel sort of the weight of responsibility in a way um, to try and get as much as possible that's left. Um, but I also realize that it's, it's impossible to really fill. Um, many, many of the gaps. Um, so I'm sort of trying to bring together existing material as well. Um, there's been a slate of memoirs that the Malayan leftists have written themselves. Um, but my primary interest is with the small people in the movement. I'm not so interested in the leadership because those people, I think, have had their chance to speak. Um, so I'm more interested in sort of the small people who's Memories will just die with them if nobody collects them. Um, so yeah, I've, but it, you know, it's an it's an impossible task, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's fascinating that you're choosing, I guess, the minor characters. So in some sense, you're using a kind of peripheral vision of what might have happened and going around, you know, what is the main narrative. So I think that's really interesting because. So I suppose that's a very artistic kind of strategy rather than a direct confrontation. Yeah, I mean, it also mm. sort of draws on you know, Foucault's idea mm. of the lives of infamous men and how they only come to light when they have this um, very fleeting confrontation, I suppose, with power. Mm. So those are the people that I'm interested in. And when you encounter these people, and many of them are very elderly now and probably may, may not have a full grasp of English, um, how have you gone about, I guess, establishing certain types of, I guess, ethical frameworks of how you're working? Like, do people say they want to be forgotten? Because there is also the right to be forgotten, the right yeah. to be erased. Yeah. All of the interviews are done in Chinese or in all in Mandarin. Um, they don't speak English at all. Um, with a few words of Malay thrown in. Um, I have explained to them why I feel it's important to record their stories. I have mostly gone in on the ticket of being a granddaughter of someone who was martyred in the movement, but I'm also careful about using that. That has opened some doors because, again, because it's not politically okay to be communist or left, in leftist in Singapore and Malaysia, most people want to just be forgotten. Most people want to just not talk about this ever again. Um, but because I guess I was persistent and I was a descendant of someone who was one of them, some of them um, opened up over time. And um, I've basically explained to them, it's, you know, if you don't record this now, it's just gonna go. And you know what the dominant narrative is, so therefore I think this is sort of like the counter-narrative or the corrective or whatever you want to call it. 
um, that needs to needs to be recorded for for posterity and and most people over time accept it. Yeah. And do you have any operative rules about what you're going to put online and not put online? And so? so there have been people who have specifically requested certain items not to be shown until they're dead. Mm. So for instance, there was this woman who used a fake passport to escape from Singapore, Malaysia, to get back to China. And she said to me, you know what, actually my family in Malaysia still doesn't know that I was part of the communist movement. Mm. And it's best that you don't show she had a lot of interesting things. Um, she had her, her ship ticket. Mm. She had her, the fake passport with a fake name. Oh. Yeah, so um, she would rather that not, that not be shown until she's dead, basically. Mm. So there were specific requests like that. Um, otherwise, most people were quite happy for me to just re-photograph some of the things they had. Um, I struggled with the decision whether to take their things away from them because I know that when they die, their children are going to throw all this stuff into the rubbish bin. So I kind of feel like I should remove things from people and keep them in some kind of a, a physical archive. But I haven't because I felt, I mean, these things are very personal to them. And I just haven't really sort of taken things away from people. I've just made photographs of them. Maybe that's a mistake in the long run because it's uh, going to end up in the bin. But it's hard to say, isn't it? Because there's a sort of tyranny of so much stuff, isn't it? How do you know which stuff is going to be valuable 20 years from now? I mean, we all live well, the so question of value is, you know, mm -hmm. is a very subjective one. To me, it's a record of the war that went on that shaped a part of, a key part of Southeast Asia, and it's not just specific to this geographical area. It's, mm -hmm. you know, it, these wars were fought across the third world, and I think we need to somehow keep some kind of a record of, of them, not just in the official military archives. And if you take photographs of something and you put it online, how do you negotiate like the authorship of that particular memory or that particular image? Um, well, obviously, uh, I, right now, I haven't put much of it online. Um, I, I think in the case of the items that I photograph, obviously, I'm the author of those photographs. Mm -hmm. um, it becomes more of an issue where I'm re-photographing things in the archive. So that's becoming a conversation between me and the Imperial War Museum, for instance, now that I'm thinking of showing some mm. of the photographs that I've made of the photographs in the archive. So obviously mm. those photographs have original authors, mm. they are of specific people. So mm. I'm starting to get into that, you know, sort of slightly trickier territory. Mm. I think that's really fascinating because I, when you photograph something, again, the, the grain and the pixel on top of that adds another layer, you know, and I guess philosophically that also speaks to, you know, like Karen, I think it was Carolyn and Steve who talked about dust in the archive, mm -hmm. and how things accumulate in the archive, not just the thing that you intend to keep, but also the other things that come along with it. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. well, okay, I mean, thank you, Chi. I mean, thank you. we have talked so much, and I think it would be really great, like, to move on to the next stage of tonight. Perhaps I could uh, begin by making a few remarks and brief questions. I was struck by your approach in um, in unauthorized medium to this uh, kind of combined activism and art making, in which you invoked um, a Vietnamese ritual. You describe it as a ritual of bringing forth the dead, um, the lost, the suspended, or forgotten. Um, the ghosts and the glitches in the archive, that process um, that you describe as particularly Southeast Asian. Um, is there a way in which your approach as a curator, as an activist, is particularly Asian? Does it do honor to certain traditions? I mean, without essentializing those, you know, what it means to be Asian. Is there something particular to the way that you approach the activating of these archives? Yeah, that's interesting. I guess, firstly, I guess the, going back to the ritual, it's very specific to Vietnam, um, because over the Vietnam War, um, a lot of people who were, I guess, involved due to the disruption of evacuations of people, people were just lost on the road. And so many souls were described that way, like they were lost on the road, 
And in Vietnamese culture, they do believe in ghosts of the lost souls. And so Avong is actually a secular, interestingly, um, ritual where a family will get together to a room where it has, you know, it's been designated as, has that function. And without having a kind of professional medium intervene, the family itself would conduct a seance. And so it's very much like we sit around a Ouija board and there's an agreement that something's going to happen. And when they get into that process, something does happen. Um, one of the members of the family will suddenly have grandma's spirit. And so questions of inheritance can be resolved or perhaps they'll be like, oh, where was grand uncle? You know, where was he killed? Where was his body? And then they'll say, oh, it was over there. Now we can make peace with the fact that his body was lost. So this is kind of a tradition, which I thought was really interesting because it was actually secular. It doesn't come from a kind of ancestral worship, although it sort of speaks to a culture that acknowledges that. Um, so I thought that was interesting to use as a methodology to think about what a, I guess, an exhibition space could be. So rather than an exhibition space saying, I'm going to present a, a list of artworks that are in themselves finite and just uh, finite and yeah, finite art objects that just exist for you to interpret, you know, the idea is how do you make links between the works and you then actively, like the person who's the shaman in the seance, actively conjure up meanings that are interconnected that perhaps might weave a sense of what Asia or Southeast Asia might be. Um, and I'm trying to go through this roundabout way so that I can say, right, we've invented these rituals, we've invented these processes, but they don't naturally come from just being Asian. And I, I think I'm really being careful here because I think, I guess, you know, these kind of traditions of lore and magic and um, longing for the uncanny, you know, I think they reverberate not through just Asian cultures, but many other cultures as well, I think Mexican and as well as Caribbean cultures have a lot of that too. So I don't think that they necessarily uh, will tell us what Asia is, but what could be found in Asia at a particular time. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Jian, as a fellow historian, I want to ask you a question about, um, I mean, you're also a kind of medium, right? Um, in activating this archive. And I wanted to ask you a question about um, mediation and the function of historical distance in, and explosions. So let, let me set the context. Um, I was struck by so many parallels, even given how different our backgrounds are um, between our lives. For most of my life, I never knew, for example, that my father was from North Korea. Um, I never knew that my mother uh, witnessed so many atrocities and almost died in the bombing of Madrid in the Spanish Civil War. These were deeply suppressed histories. Um, and I think we both know the profoundly preservative function of suppressing those kinds of traumatic histories, um, not just for the bearers of those traumas, but for uh, their children, right? Um, particularly as immigrant children in America or whatever uh, culture they are trying to assimilate in. And so I want to ask you, because um, one of the differences between the two of us is, is generational, uh, in the sense that um, I knew that I had to explode these suppressed histories, but I could only de detonate the bomb in a faraway country. So in my case, it was going to a war zone in another country to somehow experience what my parents had done. In my case, it was Nicaragua. Um, it was also reading through traumatic histories of Holocaust and living in the former Soviet Union as an activist, that somehow I was able to recover that traumatic history, but with the mediation of a faraway culture, right? There's no way that I can read about, you know, uh, Korean comfort women or, you know, without just, you know, that, that's just not possible for me, but there's a way that with a certain kind of mediation of another culture, I can confront that trauma and pain. <coughs> of my own history. So 
How far away do we need to be to detonate the bomb of these archives? Um, you, you have one generation, I mean, it's your grandfather, right? And, I mean, clearly, it, it, it must affect you. you, you've said as much. Is there something preparative for you in, in sort of unleashing this as well? Yeah, I think there is. Um, I don't think there's a generation that divides us. <laughs> well, no, I, I, I mean that, uh, so the suppressed history or archive, for me, is one generation. I see, yeah. For you, it's... It's one removed. It's one removed. I think the distance of time was necessary. I think this was a job for me, or my generation in the family, and not for my father's generation. They just couldn't do it. It was too traumatic. Um, how far do we have to be? I think, oftentimes, I think it takes one buffer generation in between. Um, but I, I don't know. It's also down to the person, I suppose. Like in my family, I'm the only person of my generation who has any interest in this history and this trauma. And I have spoken about this trauma as written into the bodies and as, as you know, I have talked about it in terms of exorcising it from our bodies. So I've also used that word sort of almost unwittingly somehow. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think one generation. I didn't have to go away. I didn't have to go into another culture to understand it. Um, I kind of looked inwards rather than going somewhere else to understand it. And interestingly, I came back into my family history after sort of, 15 years of writing about other people's stories and other people's traumas as a, as a journalist. So maybe I went the opposite way from you in, in, in a way. So, but yeah, I think the distance of time is necessary.